Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody here this evening as we begin our journey into learning more about Vermont's invasive insects and plants. So my name is Julie Filiberti, and I'm a member of the board of the Friends of Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. Our Friends organization works to support and help out the refuge in whatever capacity we can. And one thing we do is promote the refuge by organizing some educational presentations like the one that we're here for tonight. So this one is the first in a series that we put together. We're gonna to have three presentations um, on the invasive species that are plaguing Vermont. So in three weeks um, on March 30th will be our next one. We will be learning about some aquatic invasives that are affecting Lake Champlain and its tributaries. And then on April 13th, I think it's two weeks after that one, um, we're gonna be learning about the ongoing work that's being done looking at the phenology of some of Vermont's terrestrial invasives. So if you go to our website, you can find uh, the registration for both of these events on the calendar link. So we kind of hope you can continue this journey with us. Um, it's important information and are able to, to register and join us in the next two sessions in the series. So <clears throat> we at the Friends are always looking for new members and volunteers who also have a passion for supporting the refuge. It's easy to sign up to become a member on our website. Um, if you just want to go there and give some financial support through a donation, um, there's a button there to make a contribution. Uh, we don't turn any, we don't turn down any support. Truthfully, we would love to hear from you, um, get your feedback, and would really love for you to join us with membership and be able to stay up to date on all that is happening at Missisquoi. For those of you who maybe haven't been to the visit the Missisquoi before, because I think um, we might have people from all over the state, the main parcel of the refuge is located in the northwest corner of Vermont in the town of Swanton. And it was established 80 years ago in 1943 to provide a protected resting and feeding area for migrating waterfowl. It encompasses over 6,500 acres of land and water. 10 years ago in 2013, it was designated a Ramsar wetland of international importance. It's also an, an Audubon important bird area. A majority of the refuge is composed of wetlands and floodplain forest where the Missisquoi River empties into Lake Champlain. This particular area is the most expansive intact floodplain forest in the state of Vermont. The refuge also contains the largest bog in the entire Northeast, the 900 acre Maquam Bog. And in, in addition to these expanses of unique habitat, the refuge also contains shrublands and maintains 250 acres of managed grasslands. The refuge is an essential resting and feeding stopover for migrating ducks, geese, shorebirds, and other water birds. And it's a haven for 17 state threatened or endangered species, including the spiny softshell turtle, the black tern, and the recently listed eastern meadowlark. The refuge also encompasses over 450 acres on the east shore of Lake Memphremagog, north of Newport, which is a piece of land that's managed by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife. And it also has 262 acres in Westville, New York. So on our refuge, we have trails to walk on, rivers to paddle on, and we encourage you to come visit us if you haven't ever been there before. With that, I would like to honor the Abenaki by reading our land acknowledgement. The lands and waters of the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge are very special places to those who make it their home. And we, as the current stewards of this area, recognize our responsibilities in caring for these lands and waters. We recognize that these lands and waters are also important to the Abenaki Nation of Missisquoi, the previous caretakers of this land. We are grateful to them and their ancestors for caring for this land and its surrounding waters for thousands of years. We understand the importance of this land in the indigenous heritage of the region and to the Abenaki present and past. 
We recognize the hardships and suffering these families endured when they were pushed out of their traditional ancestral lands as European colonization took hold. And we acknowledge their agony and despair when their access to the Delta for subsistence was ended by the creation of this wildlife refuge. We invite our visitors to share in honoring this Abenaki home by engaging in mindfulness while enjoying the refuge lands and waters and by holding the space with care and appreciation. Tonight we have Savannah Ferreira. Savannah is a forest health specialist with the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation in the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. And <clears throat> she's pretty passionate about what she does. She knows all about what pests and diseases will be and currently are changing our forest landscapes. And she's going to be here tonight to share with us what we should be on the lookout for, uh, why we should be concerned about what we're seeing, and what we can do to help combat these invasives. So Savannah was a little bit worried about her inter internet tonight. So what she's done is um, prepared a video so that she can get the information to you. But she is here tonight to join us and she will be taking your questions at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rich to go ahead and start the PowerPoint. Hello, I'm Savannah Ferreira. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a forest health specialist with the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Today, I'm gonna to talk about some invasive pests and diseases giving some background information, as well as how to identify them in the field. So due to limited time today, I'm only gonna go over three invasives we currently have in Vermont and three invasives that are on the horizon for us. So let's start with the emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer, or EAB, is native to Russia, China, Japan, and Korea, and was first discovered in the United States and Michigan in 2002. It was only recently detected in Vermont in 2018. This insect can spread through flight, but has been more successful in traveling long distances with the help of humans, especially in the transport of firewood. This insect affects all species of ash, but has also been found on white fringe tree. As of March 2023, EAB has been detected in 36 states and parts of Canada. On this US map, the range of ash is shown in light and dark green, while the red dots indicate county level EAB detections. Maps indicating known EAB infested areas in Vermont are available at vtinvasives.org and is shown on the right here. The mapped areas indicate the likelihood of EAB based on where it has actually been detected. Each observation or detection is shown in red and has a 10 mile buffer shown in orange. We know that by the time the insect is detected, it is already dispersed. So any ash within 10 miles of a known EAB location is considered to be at risk. As of March of 2023, EAB has been confirmed in 13 out of 14 counties in the state. EAB generally has a one year life cycle although this can be too depending on infestation levels and climate conditions. Adults lay eggs on the bark of the trunk or branches in the summer and eggs take approximately seven to ten days to hatch. Larvae damage the tree by tunneling in the inner bark and outer wood, which kills the tree by interrupting the flow of food and water. As the larvae mature and get larger, their feeding galleries widen. These pre-pupa then overwinter in shallow chambers in the outer sapwood or the bark of thick barked trees. Pupation begins in late April or May with adult emergence beginning in June. So depending on infestation levels, it can be really difficult to see the actual insect. So here's some signs and symptoms of an EAB infestation if you can't find the insect. Starting on the left, D-shaped exit holes are circled in yellow. With them, you may or may not see larger holes. These would be from woodpeckers searching for the EAB larva. These woodpeckers also tend to slough off the bark, which can help draw attention to an infestation. As the larvae feed, they create S-shaped or serpentine tunnels or galleries under the bark. 
When the bark is still attached to the tree, these galleries can cause the tree to have bark splitting, where the bark is separating from the tree, exposing these tunnels. Over time, dieback will be observed. This typically starts in the upper canopy and progresses downwards. If a tree does have enough energy stores, it may send out epicormic or stress sprouts in non-typical locations. Stress trees often get root and bull sprouts that are clustered close together with really poor branch unions. Um, and that's what's shown in the far right here. Now, before moving on, I just also wanna mention that a tree that's infested with EAB can actually take three to five years to express any of these symptoms. This means that the insect can cause damage and move on to the next location without anyone noticing it was ever there. Emerald ash borer will never be eradicated from the United States, but with biological control or biocontrol, we hope to get their populations down to endemic levels. The state of Vermont has been releasing EAB biocontrols since 2020 in two locations, one in a private area in South Hero and another at a state park in Plainfield. These are very small stingless wasps that parasitize EAB larvae and or eggs. In 2020, we started releasing one parasitoid, but now released three out of the four possible biocontrols shown on the right. This past year, we conducted the last set of releases for South Hero and Plainfield locations and was able to establish a new location in Whipstock WMA. Recovery surveys are planned for the summer in both South Hero and Plainfield to see if we were successful in establishing a self-sustaining population. In addition, we're gonna be starting to release at two new sites this year in Swanton and in Randolph. The next invasive we can talk about is Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Hemlock Woolly Adelgid is an invasive sap-sucking insect that is native to Japan and was first detected in the eastern United States in Virginia in 1951 and then in Vermont in 2007. It's primarily spread by birds, but can also be dispersed by the wind and by humans transporting infected nursery stock, infested branches, and non-disinfected equipment. This pest primarily affects eastern and Carolina hemlock, but it can infest all species of hemlock. In the eastern United States, hemlock woolly adelgid is the leading causal agent of hemlock decline and mortality, and although it's present in the western United States, hemlocks have sustained minimal damage. So here's a map of the distribution of hemlock woolly adelgid in the eastern United States as well as in Vermont. If we look at the map of the left, the green shading indicates the native range of eastern hemlock and the rest of the colors are where hemlock woolly adelgid has been established. If you look at the map to the right of just the hemlock woolly adelgid infestation in Vermont, you'd see that we are up to 21 towns in three counties, with the most recent being in Windsor County last month. To monitor hemlock woolly adelgid populations, winter mortality surveys are conducted each year to see what percentage of them died from cold temperatures. Literature states we need about 90% winter mortality to limit population spread. And as you can see from this graph, in the last several years, we've been well below this 90% threshold. Even though we've had relatively low winter mortality, we haven't seen extreme range expansion. This could be because in March, we experienced periods of warming temperatures, followed by successive days of deep freezes. This temperature fluctuation could contribute to winter mortality by killing otherwise surviving hemlock woolly adelgid before they're able to reproduce. So when looking for hemlock woolly adelgid in the field, here are some common signs and symptoms. The cottony white balls at the base of a needle is the most easily identifiable sign. This is actually a protective coating used to protect hemlock woolly adelgid from environmental conditions and predators. The wool actually comes out of the pores on the insect's body and is usually present in all but the earliest life stages. Over time, as infestation develops, you'll see yellowing needles and then premature needle fallout. So this defoliation is gonna to lead to branch dieback and crown thinning, which will ultimately result in tree mortality. Depending on the extent of the infestation, this mortality can happen in a few years and it can infect all life stages. 
So the state's been releasing Laracobius nigrinus, which is a predatory beetle of hemlock woolly delgid since 2009. This past year, we released 2,000 of these biocontrols at Jamaica State Park. And although we haven't had many recoveries of Laracobius nigrinus, this year we were able to recover a Laracobius rubidus. Um, and when we sent it off for DNA testing, we were able to extract some Laracobius nigrinus DNA, suggesting that our biocontrols were able to live long enough to mate. So the last invasive that we have established in Vermont that I'm gonna talk about today is spongy moth. Spongy moth is an invasive hardwood defoliator that is native to Europe and Asia and has been reported in North America since the 1600s and has been present in Vermont since 1869. Caterpillar populations grew dramatically in 2021, resulting in the first outbreak of this insect in Vermont in decades. Oak species suffered the most defoliation, but other hardwoods and conifers were affected as well. This insect spreads locally as adults by flight, by ballooning on silk strands as larvae, and larger distances by human-assisted transport. Unlike the other established invasives I've talked about so far, this pest follows an outbreak cycle with populations reaching outbreak levels every 10 to 15 years and an outbreak lasting around three to five years. So here's the distribution map of spongy moth in the United States. The dark blue areas are where spongy moth is established and where the USDA has federal quarantines. In Vermont, spongy moth is present in all counties. However, our aerial survey data shows that population density and therefore defoliation for this outbreak is more centralized in the Champlain Valley of Western Vermont with 42,797 acres mapped as moderately or severely defoliated in 2022. Each winter, our forest health team conducts egg mass surveys across the state to get data and anticipate population levels. This graph is a little deceiving since it uses a logarithmic scale but as you can see, in 2020, we had the highest egg mass counts in the past 30 years, with peaking egg mass counts in 2021. We did see lower egg mass counts this past winter. However, these counts are still high and defoliation in 2023 is still expected. Spongy moth has one generation per year, which means it's going to hatch, mate, and die within that period. Eggs are laid in late summer and fall and over winter, not hatching until springtime. These egg masses are soft and spongy in texture and can be laid on any flat surface, not just on host trees. A single egg mass has approximately 600 individual eggs. When eggs hatch, small larvae emerge, immediately finding its way to a host species. Larvae will defoliate trees, molting numerous times by June and causing substantial defoliation when populations are high. By midsummer, spongy moth will pupate and later emerge as adult moths. Because it's an invasive, there are few natural predators of spongy moth. Two biocontrol agents that are prevalent in the state and are the most successful at knocking down spongy moth populations include the NPV virus and the fungal pathogen Antimophaga myomyga. NPV virus is typically more active when caterpillar populations are high and when infected, causes caterpillars to climb to elevated positions during the day before liquefying and dying. Caterpillars infected with this virus will arch when dying, allowing the liquid contents to rain onto leaves and then be consumed and reinfect other spongy moth caterpillars. The fungal pathogen Antimophaga myomyga is more active when we have wet and humid springs. This pathogen infects caterpillars through its skin where it will grow into its soft body and digest the insect from the inside. These dead caterpillars get long and skinny and spores are dispersed that will either reinfect new caterpillars or overwinter and wait until conditions become more favorable. So now I'd like to switch gears and talk about some invasives that we don't yet have in Vermont, but are on the horizon for us. Beech leaf disease or BLD is a novel disease affecting American, European, Oriental, and Chinese beech species in North America. This disease was first observed in Ohio in 2012, and as of March 2023, has not been detected in Vermont. 
Beech leaf disease symptoms have been shown to be associated with a newly recognized subspecies of the leaf gall nematode, Lydilinchus crenate messini. Nematode infection mechanisms are not fully understood yet, but new research indicates that the nematode is associated with the buds and leaves of beech trees of all age classes. Here's an electron scan microscope image of this nematode. Since this is a relatively new pest, the spread is not yet known. It's possible that it can be spread by birds feeding on infested beech buds, by humans transporting infected plant material, through beech clone clusters along an interlocking root grafts, or even by rain splash. So here's a distribution map of beech leaf disease in North America from February of this year. This pest has been currently reported in 12 states and Ontario, Canada. The most recent reports are in New Hampshire in 2022, Maine in 2021, and Massachusetts and Rhode Island in 2020. So just because we haven't detected it yet doesn't mean we're not looking. In the summer of 2021, Forest Parks and Recreation, with help from the U.S. Forest Service, established eight monitoring sites across the state in forested areas with a high beach component that was also in proximity to a water body. We'll be revisiting and remeasuring these plots annually. The map in the middle and on the right shows additional beach leaf disease surveys that were conducted across the state in 2021 and in 2022. These were all asymptomatic observations in both urban and forested settings. Now, although we don't have beech leaf disease established in Vermont yet, setting up these monitoring sites and conducting these extensive surveys provide us with a baseline of asymptomatic trees, which will allow us to track disease progression and spread when and if beech leaf disease gets established in the state. So what does beech leaf disease look like? In early stages of infestation, beech leaves begin to develop a striping pattern between leaf veins as shown in these pictures. These bands are visible immediately upon bud break in the spring and do not progress in severity throughout the growing season. In early infestations, affected leaves may be unevenly distributed in the lower canopy, and the best way to see them is by viewing from below, looking upwards into the canopy. In more severe infestations, the darker area has been observed as slightly raised and thicker than normal tissue, sometimes referred to leathery in texture. This is going to lead to leaf deformation. This severe symptom often leads to chlorotic banding later in the season, which is a yellowing effect to the leaf, as well as premature leaf drop. Now leaves with light, medium, or heavy symptoms of infection, as well as asymptomatic leaves, can all occur on the same branch of an individual tree. It's thought that this nematode overwinters inside of the buds, affecting leaves before bud break in the spring. This can also cause aborted buds, which will be crispy empty buds on the end of an affected branch, also leading to dieback and mortality. Over time, infestations will lead to tree mortality, which can happen to all age classes. Mortality has been occasionally observed within two to seven years, but is much more common in smaller trees. So there are a few things that look very similar to beech leaf disease symptoms. A very common one is mite patches. If we have a wet spring or summer, we'll get increased reports of the fungal pathogen in thracnose. Sometimes aphid feeding can cause infested leaves to roll or curl. And then lastly, herbicide injury can cause leaf deformation and chlorotic banding. If you're unsure if you have beech leaf disease or one of these lookalikes, just take a picture and or a sample and report it. We would always rather get additional reports than risk missing a potential early detection report. So the next invasive I wanted to talk about today that we don't have in Vermont is oak wilt. So oak wilt is a vascular tree disease of oak trees, which causes rapid decline in mortality in infected hosts. Due to the fast progression of this disease, it's thought to be introduced to the United States. However, its exact origin is unknown. This pathogen was first documented in Wisconsin in 1944 and has currently not been observed in Vermont. Although this pathogen can affect all species of oak, 
White oak family members have been found to be more resistant to this pathogen due to their ability to utilize tyloses during compartmentalization. For those of you who are unfamiliar with tyloses, it's basically just an outgrowth of cells that block conducting vessels within the tree, stopping the spread of the pathogen within the tree. Red oak family members don't have these tyloses, so the infection often leads to rapid mortality because the pathogen is inside of the vascular system and therefore could spread quickly throughout the tree. So if you think about the biggest red oak you've ever seen in your entire life, uh, this pathogen can kill it within three months. So this pathogen can spread large distances through a variety of bark and sap feeding beetles. Here's a really great poster from the New York Department of Environmental Conservation showing what nitidulid beetles can vector this pathogen. The oak leaf in the center does throw the scale off a little bit, uh, but the scale on the right shows five millimeters. And for some perspective, the average grain of rice is somewhere between 5.5 and 6.5 millimeters long. So the average vector shown here is about the size of a grain of rice. Locally, this pathogen spreads through root grafts that oak make with each other underground. And then lastly, like all invasives, humans assist the spread, uh, moving infected firewood or wood products long distances. This pathogen has currently been reported in 24 states, with the most recent being in New York in 2008. The closest infection to Vermont is in Glenville, New York, that was detected in 2013. So now that you have a little bit better background on oak wilt, we can talk about what it looks like in the field. As I previously mentioned, symptom progression differs based on oak family, with red oak family members having rapid onset and mortality, which can happen over a single growing season. Early detection will indicate that the outer margins of leaves are wilted and often discolored. This can lead to leaf drop during the growing season, which gives affected trees an early fall-like appearance. With leaf drop, branch mortality will progress from the outside extremities and progress downwards and in towards the center of the tree. If you scrape back sunken areas on the bowl, which is shown in figure A, you'll see fungal mats beneath the bark, which is shown in figure B, as well as xylem streaking within the wood. In white oak family members, this pathogen has a much slower onset and symptom progression. Again, similar to red oaks, early detection is going to indicate that the outer margins of the leaves are wilted and discolored. This is going to lead to that leaf drop during the growing season and that fall-like appearance. What makes white oak family members different is the use of tyloses and compartmentalization. Like I previously mentioned, tyloses are outgrowths of parenchyma cells, which are in the xylem vessels, that aid in the containment of pests and pathogen damage. So these tyloses are why we use white oak family members to make wine barrels and corks. They just have this extra layer of sealing to the compartmentalization process. So since white oak family members are just better at compartmentalization because of these tyloses, oak wilt isn't able to spread as quickly or aggressively within the tree. However, using these tyloses does sacrifice more of this functional xylem um, in the compartmentalization process, which reduces the water and mineral transport that the tree has. So this is going to help contribute to more dieback. This compartmentalization strategy also affects the ability to see xylem streakings and fungal mats. So in the red oak family members, these symptoms are gonna be much more apparent, but with white oak family members, you're gonna see more dieback symptoms. So the last pest I'm gonna talk about today that's also not established in Vermont is spotted lanternfly. The first thing I wanna clarify with this insect is that it's a type of plant hopper, which is a true bug and not a fly or a moth. This insect is native to China, India, Vietnam, and Asia, and was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014. Since then, it has been documented as an introduced invasive with the ability to travel long distances by humans. One of its preferred hosts is Tree of Heaven, another introduced invasive plant from Asia. Although preferred, this insect has been reported on more than 70 plant species, including grapes, hops, and maples. Here's the distribution of spotted lanternfly in the United States from December of 2022. The blue indicates infestations of spotted lanternfly, 
and the purple dots indicate where spotted lanternfly has been found, however, no infestation has yet developed. For example, in Vermont, we had one interception of live adults, but have not had a population established yet. The spotted lanternfly has one generation per year, eggs over winter, not hatching until springtime. And as you can see, these are really hard to detect in both fresh and older stages. When eggs hatch, early stage black and white nymphs emerge, which are usually found in early summer and have three instars. The fourth nymph instar are white and red and can be found later in the summer. The last two pictures are of adults with their wings opened and closed, which can be found between summer and early winter. These adults are weak flyers, but do use their wings to help them jump. If you don't see any of those life stages, there are additional signs you can look for. Feeding from host plants cause oozing or weeping, which have a fermented odor. This is commonly known as honeydew and can lead to an increase in concentrated bee and wasp activity. Buildup of this sticky fluid on plants and on the ground underneath infested plants may get overgrown with sooty mold. In the fall, adults tend to aggregate to breed and lay eggs on host plants. So here's my contact information if you wanted to reach out. If you think you've seen any of these invasives, please feel free to submit a report. If you think that you've seen an invasive, but you're not sure, report it anyway. Like I said earlier, we'd always much rather get additional reports than risk missing any early detection reports. And with that, I can take any questions that may have come up. But if you see any of these invasives, uh, report it. VT invasives is our easiest to remember go-to site. Um, they do aquatic plants, they do upland plants, insects, animals, and tree diseases. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly with any other tree pest question. If you wanted to report an invasive that way too, that's fine. Um, so feel free to take my contact and put it down. Hi, um, um, Lyman Chapin. I, I just uh, raised my hand, but um, this is this is really useful information. I, I wonder if you have any suggestions for what individual people who live, you know, just out in the world can do other than because you, you you did say, you know, report if you see something. Is there anything else that that we as individuals can do that would be useful? Yeah, um, reporting is the, the biggest, right? Um, we can't, as a state, act on anything we don't have confirmation of. So especially if you're in a new town, I'm working on getting VT invasives updated with town level distribution maps for all our invasive species. So you'll be able to see, oh, I have balsam oleodelgid here, I have hemlock oleodelgid, um, but there's no EAB. So um, I think that will help fill in the gaps. But then as you're traveling, be mindful. Um, if you're going to an area that or a state that you know has a uh, spotted lanternfly infestation, be diligent, go through a car wash, right? Check your Yeti cooler for any life stages, your camping gear. Um, don't move firewood. These are all things that are just going to help slow the spread into Vermont. Yeah, I had a quick question. Uh, this vtinvasives.org, is there one one for other states, like I'm in Ohio. Yes, um, each state usually has some type of invasive. I can look that up and then send it to Julie um, with the appropriate links. Like I think New Hampshire's is NH bugs, um, but usually if you Google invasive pest and then your state, it'll kind of get you in the right um, direction. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and at the very least, each state has a me. Um, so reaching out to them and asking how they would like to be reported um, is also an option. Okay, a, a follow-up question that you kind of covered, aside from reporting, what else can be done? Yeah, making sure that you're checking when you're traveling um, is, is huge. And then uh, what is being done to treat uh, beach bark disease? Nothing is being done to treat beach bark disease. Um, that's something that we've had in the state um, uh, probably the early to mid 1900s. 
So that's a native pathogen and an introduced scale. Um, when beech scale is acting alone, it actually doesn't kill the tree. It has to be the combination of the complex, which really starts to deplete those resources. Um, it's Beech is such a low value tree species on our landscape. Unfortunately, we value it a lot for wildlife management um, and the mass producers, but there's no effective control for beech bark disease at this time. So we want to promote genetics. So if you see a beech that has no beech scale or no evidence of any cankering, uh, which is rare but does happen, there is genetic resistance to this, try to leave it on the landscape. Um, we want those to be the beech sprouts that come up. We want the mast um, to be able to be produced from those trees and build up those populations. Thanks. Uh, Terry. So hi, uh, apparently my questions were going right to Savannah, but she can't read them. Um, so I have a question about the spongy moths. We had our oak trees defoliated for two years in a row. And last year we did start to see both of those um, diseases and fungus or whatever um, kill them, which was amazing. But they went two years in a row with being totally totally defoliated. So um, how the, how is that going to affect them this year? Yeah, that's a great question. So otherwise healthy trees, so there's no big tear outs, there's no other big decay that you can see, can typically survive three to five years of complete defoliation and be okay. Um, trees are pretty resilient. It's when you have these combination of stressors. So if we had spongy moth and if we are experiencing really severe drought in your area, um, that's when the tree wouldn't be otherwise healthy, right? That's when I like to compare it to if you had cancer um, and then you've got a cold, that's going to be a lot more severe than if you just had a cold, right? Um, so if it's just spongy moth acting alone, we are anticipating to see most of our trees be able to reflush. Um, I don't know if you noticed probably the last two years, if your tree was able to re reflush, it probably had really small leaves, um, which is just showing that the tree had enough energy source to push out a little bit more um, and should be a sign that it's going to come back in the spring. Great. We did have a second spring, <laughs> I guess people called it, um, last year, and the leaves actually came out pretty thick. So. I was really happy about that. And I'm in Williston, so we did not have a drought. So we were looking on that. Okay. And my other question was um, ash trees. How effective uh, do you feel that the chemical treatment is and how long does it last for? Is it two or three years? Off the top of my head, I'd have to recheck. Um, it's definitely in that two to three year threshold. Um, it is something that I think is worth doing in some parts of the state, uh, especially if you, have, if you have a high value tree or maybe a culturally significant or personally significant tree, um, it is expensive and treatments are gonna have to continue. Without anything, um, you will lose that ash tree. So it's either treat it or it will die. Um, emerald ash borer usually takes about three to five years for symptoms to develop in a tree. So even if you don't think that your tree is infested yet, it probably is, but you're not seeing symptoms. So it'd probably be time to act on it. Um, unfortunately, we are anticipating that we're going to lose most of the overstory ash across the state for all species. But we're hoping that with our biocontrol agents, if we can get a self-sustaining population, we'll be able to save that next generation of ash and be able to have them slowly grow back into our landscape canopy. We thank everybody for joining us. Uh, special thanks to Savannah for um, pushing through with technical difficulties and, and short internet. So she did a great job and I hope everybody got some valuable information. Um, don't forget to report if you see something. Um, you can get in touch with Savannah or the Vermont Invasives website is a great place to, to be able to do that. So, um, Join us for our, the next two um, for the next two invasive species presentations if you can. Um, 
you will be able to arm yourself with lots of great information to kind of do your part to help combat these things in, in our state. So with that, thank you very much for joining us and we will hopefully see you next time. Good night, everybody.